I'm a senior here at MIT, and this is my third year as part of the Adir Fellows program. Um, so what we're going to start out with is I'll do a land acknowledgement um, and walk through and explain a little bit about what Adir is, and then we'll introduce our speakers and start the event. So if I believe Adam's going to share screen, or am I going to share screen and present? So this is, uh, yeah, I think Adam's got it. Okay, awesome. Something that probably should have been uh, decided beforehand, but we're rolling with it. Um, but yeah, so um, I'm just going to share MIT's land acknowledgement that MIT acknowledges uh, indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which uh, MIT sits is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples connected to this land on which we gather from time immemorial. And for me, I'm in Florida, uh, which is situated on uh, Timucuan and Seminole land, and I encourage you all to go to, sorry, that was supposed to be native-land.ca to um, map out where your homes are respectively located. Um, on to the next slide. Uh, so what is ADIR? ADIR is MIT's Interfaith Dialogue Program. Each year we admit a diverse group of 42 students um, that are undergraduate and graduate students at MIT. And we put them into small groups of six or seven people from various faiths worldview, spiritual, ethical traditions, including people that are secular, and they spend a year meeting for one hour each week, um, and they discuss different topics and share their spiritual journeys. And it's been like one of the highlights of my time at MIT. Um, and in addition to our fellowship program, we also host a lot of public events. Um, so this is the third installment in our series, and we also have a couple more installments coming up this semester. Um, and if we go to the next slide, oh yes, we'll have raffles for attendees. So you can grow your own plants. Um, and also our grand prize is Apple AirPods. Ooh, shiny. Um, and then our other events this semester are um, on March 10th, we have a Buddhist chaplain and Catholic chaplain coming to join us to talk about resilience. And then on March 15th, we have our interfaith bridge building banquet um, and students can RSVP and get an $18 Grubhub credit if they RSVP before March 9th. Um, and then our final event for this semester as public is the Distilled Wisdom featuring Valerie Kaur and Greg Epstein um, about love on April 8th. And now I'll turn it over to some other dear fellows to introduce our speakers, but also apply for a beer if you're a student. Thanks, Hope. Um, yeah, and thank you again, everyone, for joining us this evening uh, for our third installment. Oh, one second, my Zoom closed. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us um, for the third installment of Distilled Wisdom. Uh, tonight we'll be in conversation about cultivating practices of gratitude in our current contexts. Um, my name is Manato Jansen, and I'm one of the MIT Adir Interfaith interns this year. Uh, and before we get started, just some uh, details about tonight and the basic schedule to inform you about. Um, everyone's audio will be muted until the Q&A session, uh, but then when we get to the Q&A, we'll allow for you to be unmuted if you're chosen to ask a question that you submit. Um, so during this next hour, if a question comes to mind for you, uh, be sure to write it down somewhere. Um, and then when it's time for questions, uh, we'll have you submit your questions by private chat to Adam Reynolds, and then he will queue them up uh, on his end. Um, we'll also be pushing out some uh, some quick like one question polls during our event, uh, just to get a sense of uh, everyone who's here um, and to hear a little bit about you. Uh, so if you're interested in that, be sure to uh, participate when the polling questions pop up. Um, and we'd also love to uh, hear more from you if you want to expand on the polling questions that we'll have in the future. So uh, yeah, feel free to uh, tell us more in the Zoom chat um, if you would like to. 
Um, and as for today's format, um, we're first going to start off with uh, hearing from our guest speakers who will be in conversation with each other on today's topic. Um, and then, yeah, and then that will be followed by a Q&A session. And then finally, some breakout rooms for anyone who's interested in continuing the discussion. Um, and then we'll also have a little raffle uh, right after the Q&A. So uh, be sure to stay for that um, if you don't mind getting some free stuff. Uh, but yeah, now I'd like to hand it over to uh, two of our dear Interfaith Fellows, uh, Bex and Kat, to introduce our speakers. Thanks, Renato. Hi there, my name's Bex. Um, I'm an MIT senior, and I'm also um, a third year Adir Fellow, which has been a lovely part of my MIT experience. And tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Daryush Mehta, who is the Zoroastrian chaplain at MIT and Harvard, an active member of the Zoroastrian Association of the Greater Boston Area, a scientist engineer at MGH in the field of voice and speech disorders, and assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. Daryush originally came to MIT for graduate school, and he lived in Sydney Pacific for five years. And during that time, he helped co-found the Zoroastrian Students of Boston that brought together students and youth from around the area to perform service activities, engage in religious dialogue, and host eminent Zoroastrian leaders and scholars. Daryush is honored to continue the work of Dr. Cyrus Mehta, who diligently represented the Zoroastrian community as MIT chaplain for 15 years. And although not a minister by training, Daryush's maternal grandfather, Dostori Dostorji Minocher Homji, was a high priest of the Zoroastrian community in Bombay and an eminent religious scholar. His grandfather's teaching, kindness, and philosophy of dialogue and inclusion are imbibed within Daryush. And we also asked both of our speakers to share a memory from their time in college. And Darius said that I was at the University of Florida for my undergraduate degree in electrical engineering. A fond memory I have is of my first summer at UF when I attended band camp as a clarinet player. Before the semester even started, I had made 160 friends, learned all the school spirit songs, and got to march at halftime at football games, which was a big deal at UF. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Darius. And as a fellow clarinet player, it was really fun to read that. Um, Thank you so much, and I'll pass it over to Kat to introduce our second speaker. Yeah, thank you, Bex. My name is Kat, and I'm a sophomore at MIT. This has been my first year as an Adir Fellow, and I've really enjoyed the conversations that I've had within this community. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Nada El Alami. Uh, Sister Nada El Alami has been the MIT Muslim chaplain to the Institute for the last three and a half years. She works with Dr. Hossein Mosaleh the Muslim Shia chaplain and is the advisor to MSA, the Muslim Student Association. Sister Nada serves the needs of all MIT Muslims by providing spiritual programming, supporting students where they need it, and advocating for student needs on campus. Prior to coming to MIT, Sister Nada served for over 15 years in leading spiritual study circles, and she has planned and supported faith-oriented programs such as camps and retreats both locally and nationally. She has also led educational institutions focusing on young, young Muslims. Sister Nada holds a BA in psychology and an MA in, in administration and leadership. Furthermore, she has been awarded an ijaza, an authenticated certificate in teaching Quranic reading. We asked both of our speakers to share a memory from their time in college and Sister Nada said, my college experience was a unique one. I started college as a new immigrant and a new wife. I switched between at least five colleges and learned more about what fits my needs better and because my husband and I switched locations. Every time I enrolled in a new college, I had to retake classes. One semester, my finals were scheduled after my due date. Thank God that my son took his time. Three children later, I earned my BA. My experience shows that we can usually get to our destination even when the roads we travel are sometimes different than we planned. Thanks, Bex and Kat. Um, yeah, we're so glad to have you both uh, with us tonight and to uh, share with us your traditions and uh, experiences um, around yeah, practical ways that um, we can more fully uh, embody and nurture our sense of uh, gratitude uh, in this time. So thank you both. Um, yeah, I think we're just gonna jump right into our conversation. So. Um, yeah, maybe we can start with uh, Sister Nada and then uh, go to Daryush. But um, yeah, could you share 
with us a brief introduction and overview of your tradition um, and how the concept of gratitude figures into that tradition and um, how you see gratitude uh, in your tradition. Well, thank you so much for having me tonight. It's my pleasure to be here and thank you for all the work that you've been putting uh, for this event and for all the dear events. Um, so I'm going to try to fly through this introduction because I need to represent a religion in, in a few minutes. So um, let's do it. Um, <clears throat> let's see. How do you go down from here? All right. So it's uh, going to be interesting to talk about this in a few minutes because of the sheer number of Muslims around the world. We make about a quarter of uh, the population of the world, uh, only 2% in the US. And um, most of us here in the US are uh, from the African-American uh, descent. Um, I share this because a lot of people don't know much about Muslims and, it, and it's important for me that people understand like how vast this religion is. Uh, Islam as uh, its essence is a submission uh, to the super uh, power. Um, we understand that submi submission to God is a way of achieving peace and coming uh, to God. All right, so we'll start with talking about the tenets, of, the tenets of Islam, and there are six of them. We'll go briefly through them. The first one, obviously, is the most important one, which is to believe in the one and unique God. As you can see here, this is a, uh, <clears throat> a super being that we understand to be transcendent, original, not having a beginning, not having an end, an infinite, all hearing, all seeing, and God has uh, presented himself through his scriptures, specifically in the Quran, through the 99 beautiful names. Some of them are, for example, the peace, the just, the merciful, the creator, the fashioner, the provider, the, gent the gentle, and uh, we know him through these um, beautiful names. We believe in angels who we understand have been created from light and submit to God uh, in, in servitude. And we believe in the messengers who are chosen people uh, that uh, have uh, you know, been a, you know, a, a people that God has spoken with and communicated with and then uh, given the, the, uh, the job of telling us about him. Um, it, we believe in the scriptures, uh, the books that have been revealed, and um, five of them have been mentioned in the Quran, Quran being the last and final revelation, uh, and considered to be the direct message from God and has been preserved since uh, it's been revealed. Um, in addition to that, we believe in the hereafter, which is, you know, like the resurrection of the body and the soul, a very long day where there's going to be judgment and then an eternal life in heaven or in hell. And in addition to that, the, the last belief is the belief in the divine decree, which is basically understanding that God, God had set some things for us uh, that uh, we are not able to change, such as uh, the families we're born into, uh, our ethnicities, our races, uh, our physical shapes. And so those have been decreed for us, but then we have total control over everything else in our life. Um, and let's talk about the practices. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to go very fast through this. Uh, there are five main practices. The first one is the declaration of faith. And basically this is a statement of affirmation of what we understand about God. And so we say that I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except for God. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his servant and messenger. This, of course, is including all of the messengers that have come before him and all of the other revelations uh, that God has told us about. There is the five daily prayer, which is a very important component of the Muslim uh, life. And this is something that uh, will take like three to five minutes, five times a day, and do it throughout the day. First one is very early in the morning, and the last one is late at night, and the other three are in between. Um, we are expected to give charity if we're wealthy, and this is usually about 2.5% of uh, the yearly savings, and that's given to people who are needy. And then, of course, there is al always like encouragement to give more. 
And then fasting, which is coming up in April, we're very excited about it. Uh, this is the month of Ramadan where we fast from dawn to sunset. Um, and uh, then after sunset, we break our fast and come together in nightly prayers and other activities. Um, and the fifth and last one is the pilgrimage, which is a once in a lifetime journey to Mecca. Mecca is in Saudi Arabia, and uh, we go there to visit this uh, cubicle shaped house that you see in the picture, uh, which is a, a place we understand that was the first a uh, place that was dedicated for the worship of uh, one God. And we follow the footsteps of Prophet Abraham and his wife, uh, Hagar. And of course, those are just the very basic pillars, um, but Islam is a lot more than that. Uh, we, you know, there are so many things to help us to uh, attain high morals, improve our character, um, you know, we learn all of these things through these universal ethics, including what we're talking about tonight, which is gratitude, which is an essential part of Islam. And we know that because we are taught to make this statement uh, whenever we go through blessed times, which is all praises due to God by whose blessings all good things are fulfilled. And then when we're having a hard time, we're also uh, expected to show gratitude. And then the statement that we're, we're taught to say is all praises due to God for all conditions. So obviously this idea of gratitude is throughout the person's experiences, not just when uh, things are going well. And then the question is, why do we have to be grateful? And I, <clears throat> I want to refer to this verse from the uh, chapter called the B. And the verse says, and if you should count the favors of God, you could not enumerate them. Indeed, God is forgiving and merciful. So if we stop a little bit and think about all the things that have, we've been blessed with, um, it's really amazing, you know, all of the positive things that we have in our lives. And I think like, it's very important that we take it some time to actually like sit down and write down, like go through this exercise of trying to enumerate all of the good things that we have, our families, our health, our, you know, our uh, abilities to do things, uh, the places we find ourselves in that bring good, good things to our lives, all of these things. And you think like, and maybe it'll take you five minutes, but I've actually tried it. <laughs> and it, it, it really is amazing how many good things we have in our lives, even our ability to see, our ability to talk, we, we take them for granted. But God is saying, take the time and think about it. And then if we actually do that, then we can see gratitude uh, come into play. And, um, you know, in another verse uh, that's uh, also here, it says, uh, God says, if you are grateful, I will surely increase you in, in favor. So this idea of having this positive attitude about where we are and, and who we are and what we're doing, uh, God is telling us that if we find ourselves in, in, in feeling this way, that he will bless us with even more things. And that's just amazing. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, with gratitude, like when, when you have this feeling of being feeling so blessed because of what God has given us, um, there is that sense of humility, the sense of like, we know our position uh, and we know, uh, uh, you know, our need and uh, we know the, the, the greatness of God. And so it helps us to create this, this uh, relationship with him, uh, a relationship of trust, a relationship of uh, love. Uh, and we understand like uh, that no matter what we do, you know, he, he has given us so much and um, we, you know, that, that relationship, you know, it's, it's a one way. He's always going to give us so much. And although we, we know in, in the Muslim tradition that he doesn't really need anything from us, uh, we're the ones in need of him. Uh, and the last thing uh, that I want to mention about uh, grat uh, gratitude, which is this feeling of being blessed, uh, which is, you know, that, that, that level of contentment with one situation not that it means that we don't strive to get more and be better uh, and do more in life. I think that that's something that uh, 
Islam, you know, uh, is expecting from each one of us. Um, but it's that sense that I'm okay. I see the good things in my life. And that sense of uh, contentment really brings a lot of greatness to the experience of the one, of the person uh, as they go through their life, be it that they're going through good things or that they're going through difficulty. So that's what I had for this intro. I thought I would take a little bit longer. Yeah, thank you, Nada. Um, that was very, I'm, I'm, I know it's really hard to sort of condense it all in such a short amount of time, but yeah, thanks for sharing. It's, um, yeah, I think it's really beautiful to sort of have that practice of having that, you know, repeated phrase of like all praises due to God for all conditions and um, like it, it sort of, like you were mentioning, it sort of cultivates humility and trust through that practice as well. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, Daryush. Hi, good evening. <clears throat> now that was beautiful. Thank you for uh, sharing it. And uh, it is challenging to distill wisdom, but Adam and MIT Adir have given us that challenge. So we will try to distill the wisdom <clears throat> of uh, what we believe in. Yeah, I was just looking up that uh, very cool uh, website on native lands. Thanks for sharing that. As Bex mentioned, my name is uh, Dariush Mehta, and in the audience, I saw him. My very, I, my my uncle Cyrus, uncle, he is here. You can see him, Cyrus Mehta. Good to see you. Uh, he was the first MIT chaplain uh, at MIT. Uh, sorry, M uh, the first Zoroastrian chaplain at MIT, and I hope I continue his good work in sharing. Uh, what we believe and, and how we uh, how we uh, live life. So uh, thanks again to MIT Adir and uh, Adam for uh, continuing this very uh, very important series of distilling uh, wisdom. I know <clears throat> it's it's not easy. Uh, if I spend more than twenty seconds per slide, let me know. But uh, I never had a had a nice slide on. Uh, there are one point eight billion uh, Muslims. There are probably a uh, hundred thousand, uh, two hundred thousand, depending on how you count, a million or so uh, Zoroastrians uh, in the world. These are perhaps the most famous of them all. If you like more modern pop culture, uh, the pop culture side versus the classical music side. I'm a clarinet player, so I know the uh, Zubin Mehta side and Freddie Mercury is all over the place. Uh, if not, you've also seen uh, the name of God. Everyone knows what type of car this is. Raise your hand. If not, uh, I will tell you it is the Mazda. Uh, and Mazda is the name uh, which very appropriately is translated as wisdom. Uh, just like uh, in Islam, God is all wise, uh, as, as Nada mentioned, unlimited knowledge. So knowledge is, is, is power uh, in, in Zoroastrianism uh, as well. So uh, the beginnings of Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism started uh, in the, the steppes of the stans of uh, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, uh, in uh, the, the Asian uh, realm and the Persian Empire included what used to be called Bactria. Uh, Zarathustra or uh, Zoroaster, the Greek name Zoroaster, Zarathustra, the Persian name, uh, he was a prophet who communed with Mazda uh, and sought a higher sense of being and wanted to understand how to live life in the best way. At the time, sacrificing and praying to multiple gods, uh, superstitions were, uh, were, were things uh, that were done in communities at the time. And uh, Zarathustra or Zoroaster 
wanted to know more and there must be something more. And he went on a long walk and uh, spoke to God and this, his, his conversation with Mazda forms our core tenets of uh, Zoroastrianism or the Gathas. If we had a bumper sticker, the bumper sticker of Zoroastrian, Zoroastrians are, uh, is good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. And I would put on the other side of the bumper sticker if you have, uh, I wanna keep, keep going, and, and the free will to choose. And this is key because it puts a, a burden on us as human beings on earth to think good thoughts, speak good words, and do good deeds. Uh, and we have to figure out what that means with the guidance of, uh, of, of prayer and our uh, Zoroastrian belief system. Good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Many, if you, uh, uh, actually, let's see if I can see everybody in here. Can you raise your hand, give me a thumbs up if, or, or if you have met, have known a Zoroastrian, whether an Iranian Zoroastrian, some are Parsis from the Indian uh, subcontinent. Uh, I see a couple thumbs up. Great. You should all now be able to say thumbs up because you've met two more with Cyrus Meth and myself here on uh, uh, on the call. So let's uh, change that answer going forward. Cool. So if you see us on the street in Zoom calls and you see this image of a winged being or sometimes without the person on top, this is the fravashi for farohar, the symbol of the soul, the three layers of the wings and the, the tail are reminding us to think good thoughts, speak good words and do good deeds. The feet remind us to be grounded and that we are here in the material world and the wings are being aspired we always aspire to be in the spiritual world and connecting to what we believe is the best. I wanted to play my grandfather. Uh, I am not a priest. Dr. Mehta, uh, Cyrus Mehta is, is uh, not a priest, but we hope to be good stewards of the faith. My mom's dad was a high priest in Bombay, India, and if you may indulge, I'd love for you to hear his words of one of the most sacred prayers in the Zoroastrian faith. Thumbs up if you can hear the audio. <laughs> Ushtasti Ushtahmai Yatashai Vahishtai Yashai. The Hashem Vahu prayer, this is in the script that actually didn't exist 3,500 years ago when Zarathustra, we believe, was alive. This is a right to left script that was created in AD uh, in the common era to write down. Old Avestan, the old Persian language that we pray in. In English, the interpretation or translation is truth is good. Hashem vohu. It is the best. It is everlasting happiness. And everlasting happiness comes to him or her who is virtuous for the sake of virtue itself, which is best. In Iran, in India, there are very sacred places of worship. The Agyaris are fire temples. And may, many of you may hear of Zoroastrians as fire worshipers, quote unquote. We don't worship the fire, we worship God, but fire is the symbol of God. And here are some images from the outside. We're not supposed to take images of the inside. What is in the inside are simply burning flames that are not extinguished for, over, for 24 hours a day over the decades. Uh, and when we pray, this goes into how we thank 
everything around us. This is a picture of a Jushan ceremony with the fire in the center and elements reminding us of plants, animals with the milk in this cup, uh, the fire, water in one cup, uh, earth. These are the various elements that we continue to thank uh, and, and believe that without them, we cannot live and, and, uh, and survive and, and be a good steward of, of, our, of our faith. Some really fun pictures of one of our actual priests in our community. This is uh, Ervad Farhad Pantaki, who is conferring uh, to his son, Zal, who is, this is uh, several years old now. He is now in college. Uh, that he was undergoing the initiation to profess his faith to the community. This is uh, Zao's mom and Zao's sister. When we are initiated into the faith, we tell the audience, the community, we believe in God. There's one God. We believe in Mazda and the teachings of Zarathustra in this Navjot. And uh, in this ceremony, we are given two articles of clothing, a sadra, or the sh shirt, muslin cloth, and the kasti, which is the cord that we wind around our waist three times to remind ourselves to think good thoughts, do, uh, speak good words, and do good deeds. So we are, it's another way to see a Zoroastrian if they, uh, they talk to you about it, not only the farahar, but we wear this every single day and put it on after cleaning our body, washing our hands. Uh, uh, so that is the Navjot. Uh, this is, I like to throw my, uh, my lovely wife. Uh, our wedding ceremony is another time of gratitude and prayer. Uh, uh, so my mom's over here and my dad's uh, over here. And Far Farhad performing the ceremony uh, with, you'll notice Cyrus Mehta. Uh, here as well. Very special time uh, of gratitude, of thanking the community. That whenever we come together, we want to give thanks. The Jushan ceremony, for example, is a ceremony where we are supposed to party six times, seven times actually a year, with New Year's being one of them. Uh, and part of the coming together is usually a potluck and connecting the material world or our world with the spiritual world. Uh, as well as thanking every element that God has uh, given us. So, a little bit of uh, pictures of what uh, the Hafshin, the Hafsin table is uh, on, on New Year's Day. So, I know it's very fast, but that's what we're here for. I love to hear any questions, comments, uh, and thanks again. Uh, we'll, we'll continue talking about uh, gratitude in today's time. Once again. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Daryush. Um, yeah, and thank you for sharing your um, your grandfather's recording of the prayer. Um, and it, it was really cool to see all the pictures as well. Um, sort of seeing the gratitude permeate through all the uh, ceremonies that you shared. So. Yeah, thank you both. Um, so yeah, I guess we can sort of add on to that. And um, with, um, well, you've introduced a bit about um, how gratitude plays into your uh, tradition. But yeah, with the with the topic of tonight's session being gratitude, um, could you share with us um, one or two spiritual practices from your tradition that um, equip and sustain your work around being grateful and maybe maybe with those practices how might they be something that we can um, adapt ad adapt and um, maybe use outside of outside of that tradition perhaps for people who um, you know are searching for meaningful practices but uh, don't belong to the same tradition and I guess we can start with uh, with Daryush Sure. Uh, great question, uh, Manato, uh, about how do we, in our practice, personal practice, how do we take the esoteric theology and scripture and 
sustain it. Uh, I think we can all do things once, but in my mind, the key is how do we create a practice that we can keep going from day to day, month to month, year to year, and pass on that practice. Uh, having uh, kids really forces you to distill the esoteric language of a religion, for example, and give them something to latch onto. So, so the two things I'd like to share with all of you, one being for me, how do I start the day? I used to start the day, and not when I say used to, I would say two years ago and before, you know, maybe the last decade, I check my email. And when smartphones came up, what would I do? Oh, I'd roll over and I'd put the smartphone and, and scroll through my email. Over time, I realized that my day was starting with somebody else's thoughts in my mind, for better or for worse. Could be for better, it could be a good thing to get something, a little piece of information. But I realized for me that could be better. And I turned that turnover look at the phone to not looking at the phone, getting up, stop pausing, taking a shower. I used to shower at night, uh, even growing up. And I think I, in, in, in undergrad, I think I turned this around as well. I showered in the morning and then prayed. That for me started the day on the right foot, unintended, because when, when Parsis, I'm, I'm Parsi Zoroastrian, the, the Indian culture comes through, and I remember my parents always saying, Jamna Pug first, the right foot first, when you step into your new house and step into a, a place of worship. So starting on the right foot. So that for me was uh, turn things in my mind, having a clean slate, praying, thanking God, thanking, basically thanking God for what I have for my family and friends. And, and then you can check email. I can check email. I can, I can start, start the day. The second thing is uh, I mentioned passing things on and, and distilling, uh, it was really distilling wisdom, is uh, with a seven-year-old son and a five-year-old uh, daughter, they really force you to, uh, you know, cut through the uh, ethereal stuff and say, all right, what do I need to know? Because not only do they not have the language yet, but their attention span is about two seconds worth. So I've distilled the Hashem Vahu prayer into two words. Be good, and then I kind of add another one every day. So we say the two prayer, the one prayer I meant uh, that you heard, and and another short one every night. That's our sustainability. Every night, two short prayers, and I've and I've slowly added more and more, and giving them the vibrations the, of prayer so they can feel what the pronunciation was from three thousand five hundred years ago. So. Those are my, my, my two elements of how I, and it's through prayer, right? It's gratitude through prayer uh, and pause and trying to pass that on to the next generation. Yeah, thank you, Dariush. I, I, like, I like how the, uh, you know, sort of cutting to the chase really gets at the core of things. Um, yeah, and it's, it's really beautiful to just like focus on, on that, inner um yeah just that core message um yeah thank you for sharing um nada would you like to share some practices as well yeah i appreciate uh what you shared with us Darusha. Uh, i think uh we, we have a lot in common one of them is starting with the right foot i i, I like that i think that's uh a symbol of having the right intention when you're starting off things and Definitely is something that we practice in Islam as well. Um, 
So as far as practices of gratitude, um, I want to talk specifically about this practice of tafakkur, uh, which is um, a call for us to reflect. And so a call for reflection, uh, introspection. Um, God offers us many opportunities to do that. He calls on us to spend time to reflect on the creation, spend time to reflect on verses from the Quran. And uh, he specifically like praises those who take their time and, and think about things. Um, specifically, he commands in, in, in one of the verses, uh, he says, uh, those who remember God while standing or sitting or lying on their sides and give thought to the creation of the heavens and the earth saying, our Lord, you did not create this aimlessly. Exalted are you above such, th such a thing. So this way of going uh, in life uh, uh, with these, you know, contemplations, what we call tafakkur, um, really helps us to like step back, think about where we are, think about the, the things that we have and, and have the sense of uh, being grateful for them. Um, and, and it is really manifested in all of the practice of Islam. All of the five pillars that I spoke about have some like uh, aspects of, of gratitude. Um, so I feel like it gives us, uh, you know, uh, different stations or stops uh, for gratitude. For example, when, when we engage in, in prayer, prayer itself is an expression of gratitude because we, we say all praises you to God. Um, after we start the prayer, that's the first thing we say. And if we are practicing Muslims and we're praying five times a day, then we actually say that we praise you to God 17 times every day. And so that's just like for us to stop and think, you know, yes, there are good things happening. And I, I, I at least I'm going to praise God for those things. Um, when we talked about zakat, which is, you know, the charity that a person gives, it's also a, a, an action that helps us to, to be gr grateful for like all of the material possessions that we have, given that we know that once, you know, we can give that charity that, that we already have enough to be able to give. And, you know, that by itself should give us a, a sense of uh, gratitude, um, knowing that some other people may not be able to do that, that there, some other people are at the receiving end of that charity. Um, fasting is also another way of, you know, trying to uh, get that sense uh, of, of gratitude uh, because when we fast and then we break our fast at the end of the day, uh, you know, we, we are so grateful for that ability to nourish our body and find pleasure uh, while doing it. It's amazing. Like you just stop eating for 17 hours and then you eat and you're like, oh, wow, this is so good. Um, so definitely like a, another stop for gratitude. Same for pilgrimage, which is uh, a place where we can uh, engage with other people uh, with the same faith. Uh, we are all treated equally. Um, we um, hope for like uh, for forgiveness. Uh, and that sense of like going to God and, and being in that space, highly, highly spiritual space, um, really gives us a, a sense of gratitude that God has allowed us to receive his messages um, and, you know, come to that place uh, to, to be there. Um, so all of these practices, I feel, are like a time to step out of the ordinary, uh, a time to maybe pause and think uh, of where we are and what we have. Um, and I could definitely spend a lot more time speaking about each one of them, but maybe I'll take just a, a, you know, a couple more minutes to, to talk about one, uh, which is the prayer. And like I said, like when, when we're praying, we're already praising God at least 17 times a day. And with that prayer, what happens is that, uh, you know, we take that time to say, okay, I'm going to step out of where I'm doing right now. I'm going to take this a uh, few minute break, no matter what's going on around me, no matter what I'm doing, this is now my me time, right? Uh, and you kind of like put the world on hold for something that is much better than 
uh, just the regular schedule. Um, and then by doing that, we're basically saying that God is greater. We have very important things in life. What I'm doing right now is good, but there are other things that are much, much better that I also need to focus on. Uh, so it kind of puts things back into perspective. Um, when we take those few minutes to pray, we are very cognitive that we're not going to allow our current situations to be overwhelming for us. We're going to be in control of that situation. And we speak to God and we express our thoughts and we, we do our daily affirmations and we acknowledge the goods that we have in our lives. And we acknowledge the presence of God and the presence of things that are greater than us. Um, and we, you know, with, with prayer, there's this affirmation that we don't just live for today, but we live for greater purposes. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sharing these things because I think these things are very relevant to other people, uh, even if it's done in a different format. And I'm going to get to that as well. Um, so in a sense, like this prayer that we do is uh, a little bit of like letting go of things that don't really matter on the long run and finding this peace with ourselves and uh, being introspective uh, in our lives. Um, so something that people can do, and I don't, if, of course, it's not going to be equivalent to the five daily prayer, but, uh, you know, something that may be helpful to people is to think about uh, taking time from a very busy schedule. We all know what it's like to be at MIT, but uh, maybe like two to three minutes a day, maybe five minutes a day to step back from our situations, uh, reflect, express our thoughts, acknowledge the good we have and refocus uh, our lives. Um, and if we can create like a system where we have a five minute break every day just to do this, I think that would be something that would add a lot of benefit to uh, our lives. Um, we could maybe have a journal, write things down, or just think about them. But, uh, you know, try to think about how we feel and what are the things that are making us happy. Um, why are we doing the work that we're doing today? Why is it meaningful to us? And then what is our ultimate purpose with that? What is our ultimate purpose with the work that we do, with the relationships that we have? Um, express those, th th those uh, thoughts and um, think about what they mean to us. Um, acknowledge the good things that we have in our lives and letting go of things that won't matter on the long run. If something is very important today, but we know like two years from now, it's not gonna matter then maybe it shouldn't affect us as much. Maybe we shouldn't be attached to it as much. Um, just getting back to that sense of control uh, to our life that at this time <laughs> in our lives, we all need very much. Uh, so this is just an idea. And if you'd like me to talk about more, of course, the idea of fasting is, is a great one um, where there's a lot of uh, the sense of gratitude that we can uh, you know, uh, cultivate from. Um, so happy to share more if you'd like that. Yeah, thanks, Nada. Um, yeah, I think it's oftentimes like I've found myself like overwhelmed with the idea of like putting a lot, like putting a lot of time out of my busy schedule to sort of like have these big moments of, you know, reflecting and being grateful. But I, I think, yeah, just even having like two to three minutes, like you mentioned, per day, just like having a moment to really sit and like see what what we take for granted is very, yeah, I think it's really doable and something I might want to try out as well. So yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, we'll just kind of close with this, um, well, in terms of prompts, um, we'll sort of close with um, maybe hearing from both of you about uh, like a specific story or a moment from your life of uh, how these practices have impacted you personally. Um, yeah, what, what might be some stories um, 
of you practicing gratitude and taking something away from that. Um, I guess we can start with Nada. Yes, I'll be happy to share something. Although I feel like really like gratitude, as I mentioned, is really practiced throughout everything that um, I do as far as uh, worship and Islamic practices. Um, but I can talk about one specific uh, event. And I'd like to share a story when um, around uh, Thanksgiving of last year, uh, my family and I decided to spend a few days in Michigan with my daughter. My daughter lives in Michigan with her uh, husband and three kids now. Um, and, uh, you know, we were very careful with COVID and everything, and we wanted to spend that time uh, with family. And so we decided, okay, we're not going to fly because not, that's not very safe around Thanksgiving. Um, and let's just drive. And anyone who knows how long to drive is, it's very long. It's about 12 to 14 hours drive. And because it was all of us, we ended up taking two cars. Um, so the, it was like this big trip. And my daughter who we're visiting is actually with us uh, because she was visiting us and we were kind of driving her back to her family. It's a long story, but it, we were driving her back. So we had her and uh, other family members and of course her three kids. The oldest is, uh, at that point, she was five and the youngest was three months old. Um, so because we also were trying not to really uh, make a lot of stops and meet a lot of people along the way, we decided to drive at night. We thought, oh, the kids will be asleep. This will be like a great, you know, uh, way of doing it so that we could just, you know, get it done through the night and then uh, it will be much easier than to try to drive during the day when everyone is awake. Um, so we did that and um, we started to drive, everything was good. And then of course it started to snow as we we're driving and became a, kind of a difficult drive. Um, so for me, you know, it was a little bit scary um, uh, and we thought about stopping or keep going. And then we decided let's just keep driving. And the reason was we really wanted to just get through this uh, during the night so that the kids can be asleep and it will be much easier for everyone. Um, and usually like when, uh, you know, it's at night, we're driving, it's snowing, you can't really see much. That's usually, you know, a situation where I would start thinking about all of these scary things that could happen, uh, you know, and uh, it wasn't, you know, was not feeling great about it at that point. Started to get worried a little bit, but I decided to do something about it uh, and thought, okay, let me try to think of the good things that are happening here. So I started to think about all the good, the good things uh, within that specific situation. And I thought about how, yes, all of these things were difficult, but at least I was with people that I cared about and they cared about me. And at least my traveling mates uh, provided good companionship. So, you know, my family and I kind of get along and we, we talk and we laugh and so that was fun. Um, we definitely had lots of snacks and lots of games to play along the way. Um, we also had the option of switching drivers because a few of us could drive. So it wasn't really a burden on one person. We definitely had a clear destination. We wanted to get there as early as possible. And we had you know, good cars, so that was not an issue. And then I started thinking like, okay, the storm couldn't last forever. Like, it, you know, at some point it's gonna get better. It's just a matter of, you know, being patient with the difficult part. Um, and honestly, that changed the whole uh, outlook on that situation. That sense of being grateful for the things that we actually had um, made it bearable, made it more than bearable, made it a little bit of fun uh, because then I could focus on 
all of these positive things and you know we started playing games and talking and, and doing all of these things and um ended up being okay and when i was in that situation i thought about it uh and i thought how uh th that situation was very very similar to our collective experience with covid um uh, we kind of all belong to like small groups of people. Maybe uh, you have family members, maybe you have MIT colleagues, maybe you have friends or people on the pod. You know, all of us belong to something. And we, of course, are all feeling isolated right now. We're all missing our usual experiences, especially our social experiences. Um, and we all feel the difficulty of our current situation. It's a little bit scary because of the unknown factor. Um, some of us may be anxious, some of us may, may be worried, some of us may be, um, uh, you know, in pain because of losses and, and other things that have come with COVID. Um, but it was very similar to that ride. You know, my, my traveling group and I were going to ride the situation out and no matter what the difficulties were, just like we are all trying to ride out COVID. So at the end, this wasn't, this was back in, in the, around Thanksgiving time. Now the trip is a memory and I'm hoping that a few months from now, COVID will also be a memory for all of us. And we can maybe look back and think of some of the good things that we had through it. And that's my story. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I I hope so too. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, I guess showing how you know being grateful can help us find peace um, in like just what we have in the current moment, even even in the scary moments. And um, yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, Daryush. I, yes, uh, thanks so much, Nada. That was beautiful and inspiring. Um, there are many, many stories of I can think of. And you know, once you have kids, if you have kids, and once or you see kids, you realize they take over your life. Uh, and what they feel, you feel. I wanted to tell a story about loss that is unfortunately, and then kind of another, I was saying it's, and especially nowadays is unfortunately hitting many of us uh, and very close to home. And loss can look in many, you know, loss is many different forms. It doesn't have to be physical, uh, the form. Uh, it, it, it death is very, very traumatizing loss can involve losing a relationship, losing a, a feeling. Uh, it can be partial and be as difficult. The story I, 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 that came to mind of, of loss, I, I, I've, I've lost one uh, close family member, my, my uncle, uh, in the last Few years, uh, his, his death anniversary is just a few days ago. Uh, my son, every now and then, will wake up in the middle of the night hysterically crying. And many of those times, it's because he remembers his first loss. And when you're a six, seven year old, and, and, and so, so yeah, when, when you're a four to seven year old, your, your world is a particular scope. His loss was of a loss of uh, the first living being that he had grown to love that was smaller than him, not his sister, it was a fish. When he was four years old, he wanted a fish for his birthday. The fish lasted almost two years. That, that's a, that's a pretty good for a beta. But for a six-year-old, it was his first experience.
experience dealing with having somebody that was there every single day. And for him, it was since he could remember, right? Since he was four, he didn't know what a day was without seeing this fish and uh, playing with the fish and keeping it company. Uh, and my son is very, has a very high emotional IQ, uh, emotional quotient, he has a high EQ. And to this day, we'll still remember, he has a framed eight and a half by 11 of the fish at his, the, the, the head of his bed. So he sees this fish every night as well. Uh, uh, and, and that's, and teaching a, a child how to deal with loss, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's special to start early. I don't remember, and maybe I did. I mean, how, how do you create and equip yourself mentally, emotionally, physically to deal with loss. So one of the ways to deal with, uh, and, and even to memorialize, uh, Maui was, uh, was his name, as if you know of Moana, he named the fish after Maui, the demigod. Uh, so Maui is laid to rest outside under our tree in the backyard, back patio, it's not a yard. Uh, and we, we prayed after uh, the, the, the day that he passed, and we had an amazing memorial the year after to, to memorialize uh, and remember Maui, and that was spontaneous. I didn't do that. A six-year-old thought of memorializing through reading prayer. I didn't do that. It came out of this little being. So... How has the practice of prayer impacted me? It, 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 it's uh, uh, through the next generation. It's seeing how they create the tools to cope. And I'm sharing that because this is a time when we're all coping in our own ways. Uh, and many of us are realize that we are fortunate, I'll dare to say spoiled, uh, by what we are able to do with an internet connection, speaking how we are speaking now, when many, including us, are dealing with loss of family, friends, relationships, loss of what we thought was a way to live life. So, Prayer has been a big part of how I help uh, with that. Uh, and I guess I, I say a prayer for everybody, uh, everybody here and, uh, and, and your family, friends, colleagues uh, on campus, off campus, because campus is not campus anymore. It is everywhere. The world is our campus. I think we, we're finally realizing we're all in this together. I think we... If anything, the pandemic is showing us that borders are just constructs. Borders are not borders. That's why Doctors Without Borders has said it right. I mean, we need to heal the world because the world is us and our neighbor is everywhere. So I, uh, I hope out of tragedy springs continued renewal and uh, progress for for everyone. Uh, I know it's a little little bit of a rambling, but that's you know that's where we are. Look forward to hearing uh, in the chat and, and and in words. I'd love to hear everybody else's uh, voices uh, as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. What what a beautiful story of like just a reminder that you know, age really doesn't matter when it comes to this, this need to like cherish and memorialize and like, just, just to know that like, you know, this, this genuine desire out of prayer to like memorialize this lost loved one um, was, you know, just age, age has no, 
limit to that. And I think I think that's also very, um, yeah, just very applicable today as we're sort of being surrounded by a lot of a lot of loss of all kinds. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, and and we would love to hear from everyone else here as well. So. Um, yeah, and we are we are headed towards our um, Q and A and discussion portion. So, um, yeah, we'd love to hear some of that as well. Um, before we head into um, the Q and A session with our audience, um, we we wanted to give uh, each of our speakers some time to maybe ask one question that they might have for each other. Um, and then, and then we'll open up the floor for questions for everyone else. So, um, yeah, if you have a question that you've that you've had in mind, um, if anything, if you'd like to share anything, um, please type it in the chat box. Um, and yeah, we just ask that you send a private direct message to Adam Reynolds just so that um, we can have we can figure out how to cue the questions and have a little bit of um, order with that. So. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so please feel free to start uh, sending your questions to Adam. Um, but yeah, Sister Nada and uh, Daryush, we'd love to um, open the space to you first in terms of questions, so. Um, yeah, I think that uh, Daryush has answered a lot of the questions I had about um, how he deals with uh, losses and times of difficulty and still have gratitude. I think, you know, one of the things that I've been wondering uh, as I heard Darius speak is, uh, I believe Zoroastrianism is a religion that has a lot of uh, communal practices. And I'm wondering like how things have changed with COVID, uh, especially, you know, coming together for these ideas of um, worship and being grateful and um, showing love to each other and to the creator. Um, have you had to make any changes, any innovations to your practices in order to be able to continue to practice? Thanks so much. I know that, that that's a, that's a uh, th thank you for the question. Uh, a very good one, how we as social beings are continuing to be a good steward of the faith uh, without being able to do what we were used to doing. Uh, and the, 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 one of the points I, I wanted to mention is as many of the times of life are communal, I showed the Jushan picture, the weddings time, the wedding time. Seven times we're supposed to get together in like a potluck and and be amongst uh, each other. On the other hand, the act of prayer with others on a more frequent daily or weekly basis, such as Sunday church going or Friday Juma, is not is different the daily prayers or weekly prayers uh, and I'll give a little bit of the Indian context because that's my my parents uh, my parents side uh, ancestral uh, how we practice Zoroastrianism is the fire temples that I showed a picture of there isn't a time where we all go to church on Sunday to the fire temple uh, as a community and listen to the priest and then all pray together or sing together that act is actually a very personal one, a uh, family-oriented one, or, or, or personal. You walk in whenever you uh, want to or, or can. Uh, so the act of prayer is, is, is also a very personal one in, in the Zoroastrian faith. So that has been able to keep, you know, you keep that going. You, you form a place. I'm wearing a prayer cap to show everyone what, uh, uh, what we do before praying is wash our hands uh, and and cover our head as a kind of a, a, a way to respect the higher being above us, the spiritual world and the uh, material world or our world. So this 
we 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 can create what what, what one thing I, lo I I love I mean many I love about many practices and and my dad follows a lot of his Islamic practices as well. I, I mentioned the chat he he fasts every Wednesday and I think comes from his, his growing up learning about uh, Islam as well. Uh, is being able to pray anywhere. Uh, you can create a sacred space in the middle of chaos by grounding yourself, simply closing your eyes, intoning or verbalizing, creating the vibrations and, and wearing a prayer cap. Uh, so that has been able to sustain through this pandemic. What hasn't been able to sustain is right, being able to have a potluck. By definition, there's no bringing your stuff to anybody else's house and eating somebody else's um, with, with someone else, with utensils. So we've had Zoom trivia nights with the, the, the uh, the, the local crowd. We have about 300 Zoroastrian, uh, 200 families. Uh, well, 125 families, maybe 300 uh, to 400 members uh, in the Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Vermont uh, region. Uh, and we've had Zoom gatherings. Uh, what, what I really miss is the, see if I can pop this up. We were part of gratitude, right? We were able to participate in an annual meal packing event. Uh, here's Greg Epstein. I forgot Greg was in the background over here, uh, our humanist uh, chaplain, uh, dear dear friend and colleague. He, he and the Humanist Hub kicked off this, uh, this event and we've tried to continue it doing this uh, grat very gratifying experience of feeding the needy, uh, the, those who are food insecure in New England. Uh, I miss this. Uh, we miss this because we tended we did this in the Thanksgiving uh, time frame. Uh, this for the first time, and you know it was supposed to be the tenth anniversary, and it didn't happen. So we we have to pivot. Uh, our our upcoming uh, what we have right is upcoming Jushin ceremony will be. Uh, and we've had Jushin ceremonies that are through Zoom, uh, where our priests are, are praying from, uh, from a home. And we are trying to do a pickup for, a, uh, for the, the food aspect, because food's a, a big deal. Uh, and, and, and let's see how that goes. Uh, it's a lot of work to have a, a common space for people to pick up. The, it's usually catered food, and uh, in addition to potluck. So we'll see if the catering works as, as, a, as a pickup. Uh, it's just happened. Uh, just I just saw the announcement. Uh, so that's coming up. Uh, our new year, one of the new years, mentioned the lunar calendar, right? We have we have three calendars. Uh, one group thousands of years ago forgot to keep track of the leap day. So over time, that leap day turned into the delaying of the seasonal new year due to spring. The first day of spring is is New Year uh, for for one calendar and. And the other calendar said, no, it's actually August. Uh, and then they said, well, it's August because we lost track of time, but we're going to do it because it's uh, linked to a particular uh, royal family and when, when that uh, king uh, started. So we have one in August. We actually have a July one because that is a, another group. All, all Zoroastrians, but there are three calendars floating around. That's fine. More reason to party. And, and we have another, you know, we do the January 1st New Year. So uh, hope, hopefully that gives you an idea of how we're trying to navigate the pandemic. Um, but thanks, uh, thanks for for the uh, for the question. I, I, I can I can throw the same thing back at you. I I was thinking of I guess when we were talking about loss uh, about the afterlife and how Islam uh, views the afterlife if there's one. Uh, you were you mentioned heaven and hell and uh, judgment. And I know that there's a lot of uh, commonalities with Zoroastrianism and, and Islam in, in terms of just having those concepts of judgment and heaven and hell. But uh, if you had, you could describe a little bit about the afterlife, that would be uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think it's pretty straightforward in Islam. Basically, we pass to this next life. We wait for a time when we're all resurrected. And then we all come to this newly created space 
uh, where we are all held accountable for, for our actions in this life. We each uh, will be presented with our deeds, the good and the bad, and they will be literally put on a scale to weigh them and see which one uh, weighs more. Um, we understand that God is very forgiven, very merciful, that we are born to make mistakes and that he will forgive these mistakes. But we also know that he is very just uh, and that a lot of people who get away with things in this life, uh, part of God's justice is that they will not get away with that in the, in the hereafter. So each one will be judged. Uh, it's between him and God. And um, depending on that, God will decide what to do with that person. The mercy of God is 99% more than the mercy that we see in this life. So we expect that, you know, to uh, see that mercy in, in ways that we've never seen it before. And uh, no matter where we are and what we do and how we go about our lives, we know that only by the grace of God that we would be able to attain his pleasure. And really it's not about heaven and hell for, for a lot of Muslims, it's about being good with God. <laughs> you know, it's about finding that place where you feel good about your choices in this life and you hope that he is pleased with uh, your actions. And then the rest is not as important in my opinion, um, if that makes sense. And, and Muslims will go through that and, and people of all faiths will go through that. And just because a person is Muslim, they're not guaranteed salvation. Uh, we still have to be good people. We still have to do the right things. I, it's, it's so similar <laughs> in terms of what you mentioned, the weighing of the good and the, 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 the not so good that you do. Uh, we have a very similar construct of, of uh, where you go after the material body decays and the soul continues on. Uh, and then Fresho Kedati, we call Fresho Kedati, which is the end of days where everyone eventually goes to the, that's uh, kind of like that, that final happy place. Right. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, I wanted to show, let's see if this, this is, this, I'm not. So in, in the Southern, I mentioned we wear one of the, the muslin cloth, right? So the Southern has a V, let's see if you can see this. There is a little pocket sewn in the V neck of of the sadra this is one of the articles of clothing you get uh and it's kind of like a shield and and you're almost like a soldier for god that pocket we are to use at the end of every day to rem as we pray to remember our good thoughts to try to outweigh the bad on a daily basis almost like being our own uh judgment uh and because at the end of the at the end of our life we'll be judged uh, in a similar way so try kind of it's like a daily way to kind of think of like hey you got to remember i mean this is this is not just something you got to catch up later uh you got to do it every single day yeah and actually this reminds me of the the uh pilgrimage uh the one i talked about as like as the fifth practice uh for Hajj, yeah the Hajj, yeah um this is a time when we really think about that day when we meet God, because everyone is wearing the same clothes, which is usually two pieces of white garments for men, very, very simple, just barely like covering the body. And we come to him in very, very humble ways. And there is no distinction between people there. Everyone looks the same. And we're all in this one space. And there are so many of us, it's about two and a half million people in the same space at the same time. And we're all hoping for the same thing, which is to be forgiven, to be accepted, to have the mercy of God. And it's just, it's such a great reminder to be in that space. I personally have gone to Hajj and um, it's the best experience of my life. If I could do it again, I would. <laughs> right now, I don't know if you noticed the picture earlier, like we're not even allowed to do that. Uh, last year, we couldn't go to Hajj people. Uh, you know, we're not allowed because of COVID. But anyway, yeah, that that that, that is um, similar to, to your thinking about like this idea of like, you're preparing here 
you're not going to wait until there to realize, oh, what have I done? But there are, right. these, there are these like reminders along the way here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you both. Um, we have some questions coming in, so I want to make sure we can um, get to them since we're, I know we're running a little bit out of time. So um, I guess it'll be a bit of a lightning round um, question time, but we're going to start with a question from Hope. we can unmute her. Yeah, I was just wondering if you had a quick story from your tradition um, that has helped you cope with the pandemic. Uh, yeah, it could be from scripture, or tradition, or anything. I'll, I'll do a lightning one. Uh, when we pray uh, that, that there's a second prayer Yata hu vairio prayer, uh, which there's a story in the uh, in in the in our you know legends of, of of Zoroastrianism where there was a ship with Zoroastrians that came into uh, uh, speaking of lightning, lightning and storms, and they were going to capsize, and the entire crew started praying this one prayer. And it takes about thirty seconds to, to to say, but they said it over and over and over and over again. And the magnitude of that prayer with the, the number of people who uh, that prayed it orally, uh, verbalized it. And the story goes that they all survived, the weather became better, and that uh, kind of story carries through to something very practical. It's, you know, you can think of it as the placebo effect, right? But at the end of the day, this is the charge of some centering, whether you're a humanist, an atheist, I like we, as, as many like to say, from A to Z, from atheists to Zoroastrians, I mean, however you want to center your life uh, is, uh, so that's, that's the kind of quick story of how to, how to help, how to cope, right? Yeah. Um, well, in Islam, the, the idea, the concept of hardship is, is a common theme that we see uh, within the stories of the prophets that came even before uh, the last one, Muhammad. Um, and the idea is that hardship is not a, a manifestation of God's anger. If anything, hardship, the more that God is happy with someone, the more hardship he will give him because he wants him to attain this level uh, because of his patience and gratitude that will allow him to be much closer to God uh, in the day of judgment. Um, it, it, the particular story that comes to mind is the story of prof prophet uh, Jacob, uh, who uh, we understand um, had lost uh, his son. And uh, for many years, uh, you know, we, we know that uh, there was this betrayal from uh, from uh, uh, Joseph's uh, brothers to put, take him away from his dad because his dad loved him very much. Anyway, it's it's a very long story, but Jacob spends years, you know, very very upset about the loss of his son, and to the point where he loses his eyesight. Like he cries so much, and he 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 asks for for help from God so much that. At some point, like he's just God, you're the only one who's going to fix this. And the story goes, it's a very long story uh, described in one of the chapters in the Quran. Uh, at the end of the story, uh, Joseph has become the king in Egypt and he calls his, his dad to come to him. They are reunited and he gains his sight again. So this idea of hardship is just a common thing that every human is going to go through. And it's not it's not that God uh, has forsaken us. It's just how life is. We just, you know, we take the good times and we take the bad times and we, you know, we, we uh, try our best with both of them. Thank you. Um, we have time for, I guess, one last question. Um, before we get to that, um, just a reminder that we have a survey, um, a little evaluation form. Um, it would really help if uh, we could get um, you to participate in that, um, just as we're sort of preparing for our future events and seeing um, how we might want to do our future events as well. And that is also where you can enter into our raffle, which we will 
uh, announce very shortly. So, uh, but before that, I'm gonna um, read a question from Lynn, um, who asked, what do you do when it's particularly hard to muster gratitude uh, in especially hard times? It's a very good question. I think that no matter what the situation is, it's important to remember that not everything is lost. I mean, our, our abilities to function as human beings is amazing. And I think that if we can continue to be focused on that, that, that helps a lot. But I understand that sometimes people come to a place where it's very difficult uh, to even think of that. And for a Muslim, uh, when you come to that point where things are so dark, then you speak to God and you tell him where you are and how you're feeling. And you explain that you're waiting for his help and his support to come through. You are very clear about, you know, as, as Muslims, we understand that we, we do not understand everything that happens to us or around us. There are a lot of things that happen for other reasons, greater reasons, things that we may not see until a few years from now, uh, or may, we, we may not see at all, uh, but sometimes we don't understand and it's okay. And we just tell God that, you know, this is difficult and we don't understand it, but we understand that you, you are wise and you are gentle and you are, you are caring and if you have uh, decreed for something to happen, then there must be a good reason. And even though we don't understand, we can go through that knowing that we have this level of faith in, in God's decree. Yeah, it's a great question. How do we get through the really, really, really challenging parts of life uh, and maybe what's implied is how do you get through it and still believe that we should persevere? Why, what, why should we persevere when so much heartache uh, happens? Uh, I, I mentioned that uh, Ahura Mazda, Lord, the Lord of Wisdom, the, the Zoroastrian God is all wise, but not omnipotent, uh, not all powerful. I mean, the the, the, the flip of the coin, the, the evil spirit is there and we have to constantly fight against the urges to almost retaliate and be maybe vengeful or completely depressed or you give up uh, and lose hope. And that's what prayer helps with. It gives you the pause before your mind goes to certain sides and then the mind becomes the words and the words becomes the deeds before that path goes a certain direction i think prayer helps provide the grounding and really the pausing i mean that the longer you can just sit in your thoughts and, and i i love reading how to meditate better right how and, and reading the hindu uh, approach the buddhist approach to meditation is the way i try to glean in the, the how, what are the practices that can help me uh, and it helps in prayer. It, how, how do you basically how do you stop your mind from creating worlds that may not be there and and allowing it to calm the waves? So that's my two cents of how to deal with the really 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 challenging times of life. Yeah, I'm gonna leave the Zoom room open after this as well, but. Um... So feel free to stick around if you'd like to um, have smaller conversations. Um, but again, we'd like to thank both uh, Sister Nada El Alami and Daryush Mehta for uh, bringing to this space um, all of your stories and experiences and wisdom uh, around these practical ways to um, nurture gratitude in our current time. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure, like like myself, it's it's been a very for me, it's been a very enriching hour and I'm sure we'll all have um, something that we can take away from this space um, to maybe practice or ponder. Um, so yeah, with 
with a lot of gratitude. Thank you both for your time tonight. Uh, and thank you to all of you who uh, attended tonight. Um, thanks so much for coming. Uh, so yeah, feel free to stick around for further discussion if you'd like, but thank you everyone and have a good evening. Thank you, Manato. Thank you everyone for being here. Yeah, great to be with you all. And, and, and Nada, Eric, great to see you as always. Of course, likewise, Darius. Any lingering questions anybody have? I know we maybe didn't get everybody's, but yeah, happy to hang out. Yeah, same here. If anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to answer. Uh, if you guys are curious, the the one question we didn't get to, um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, and the person who asked is is no longer here, but just um, for your own information, there was. Um, how do they distinguish their days? Do they, uh, this is a question for either of you, how do you distinguish your days? Do you intentionally treat some days, not counting holidays, as uniquely different than others? Is it worthwhile to distinguish our days as opposed to facing each day like the day before and the day after with the same practices? Mm -hmm. That's a good, good question. question. Yeah. Yeah. I sleep in on Saturday mornings, <laughs> yeah, and, and Sunday mornings. I, I, so the days are different, but uh, I guess what happens after I wake up, I, I try to keep that the same. Yeah, but, so yeah I think, yes or no for me. I think for 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 Muslims, there's more a sense of seasons rather than days and weeks. So there are the, the season of fasting, then there are some other things that happen during the year, like the pilgrimage and some other practices as well. So it gives the sense of renewal to, it's not, it's not all the same. There's that sense of change. Cool. Yeah. Uh, well, this was lovely. Um, thank you both for sharing so openly and, um, you know, stories from your lives. Um, uh, for um, you know, rising to the challenge so well of the impossible task of uh, summarizing your tradition um, so succinctly. So sorry, I was going so fast at the beginning because I thought I'm not going to finish, <laughs> but <laughs> I guess I did have a little bit of time at the end. So, uh, yeah, I think it, I think it all worked out well. So, uh, oh, did you have something? Oh, yeah. uh, I was just going to like thank you and wish you all good night. I have many P sets to complete. Oh yeah. I really well, enjoyed thanks being for, here. Thanks yeah. for being here, Hope. Yeah, thanks, Hope. All good right. luck on our P sets. All right, thanks. We'll see you around. Yes, I know. It's uh it's gonna be the next few months are gonna be very critical. So mm -hmm. that's all. Uh, Cross our fingers. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Dariush, for everything you shared. It was wonderful. Likewise, it's uh, it's a, uh, it's it's fun. I know. I always, I always get learn a little bit more. We can never know everything. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you too. Right, thanks. Cat, anything? Did we cover everything. Thank you.